So uh, good morning everyone, like, I hope you're all well, uh, given the current pandemic circumstances we find ourselves in. And thanks very much for joining this Research by session. Uh, as alluded to by Dolores, my name is Daniel Hurley. I have a brief background, I'm originally a biochemistry graduate from here in UCD, and I went on to pursue research interests in bioinformatics and molecular microbiology over the course of my PhD and postdoctoral work. Uh, currently, I'm just over a year into a faculty position in the food science nutrition section of the School of Agriculture and Food Science. The main purpose of this research bites talk, or uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today, is to give the broader members of the Institute a short introduction to my research program, with an emphasis on short, as has been highlighted. I'm uh, confident that Geraldine will blow an air horn should I run over time. So, uh, with that in mind, I have a long faced accusations of being a salmonella sympathizer as a salmonella is a predominant foodborne pathogen that I find really interesting and it's one of the aspects that my research program focuses on. For today, I'm going to introduce some recently published work characterizing foodborne isolates of salmonella that were recovered from multi-state outbreaks in the United States. And this was conducted in collaboration with the US Food and Drug Administration as well as also talking about current work on an application beyond conventional whole genome sequencing that enables rapid phenotyping of hundreds of thousands of unique mutants simultaneously. And this is using a technique called Travis. So for the purposes of today, I will focus on a particular Salmonella serovirus, Salmonella Tennessee. And this was an isolate which exhibited an unusual virulence phenotype after carrying out gentamicin protection assays, infecting human macrophages in vivo. This particular Salmonella Tennessee isolate was found to persist and survive intracellularly with less than a one log reduction in viable bacteria between two hours and seven days post-infection. The control Salmonella type murium isolate, which we see to the left, uh, peaked at 24 hours post-infection and decreased over time until it could no longer be recovered five days after infection. This is unusual as macrophages are phagocytic cells of our immune system and they're typically responsible for killing invading pathogens. So this is something that we don't want to see. Uh, when I was invited by Geraldine to give this talk, it was asked to be addressed from the perspective of the challenges facing my research. In this case, in the area of food safety, with the advent and the broad adoption of whole genome sequencing, especially in a regulatory sphere for food safety, there's been an explosion in the sheer volume of uh, data that are publicly available. As of today, in July 2020, there are over 256,000 whole genome sequencing data sets available for Salmonella alone, and that's just one pathogen. While this is fantastic from a monitoring perspective and it forms part of the greater digital immune system for food safety. The vast majority of these data go underutilized or are merely archived. Even though we as a research community have collectively sequenced all of these segmental isolates, there's still a lot we do not understand about this pathogen. And a large proportion of its genome is made up by what you may have heard as uh, hypothetical proteins, meaning that these currently have no known function. And uh, this is a significant challenge, and it's one that I'm uh, working to address as part of my research program. To respond to this challenge and determine what genetic features of Salmonella Tennessee enabled this long term survival we saw on the last slide, I decided to use a technique called TRADIS or transposon directed insertion sequencing. At the risk of sounding like a lazy or unenthused researcher, I think you'll agree and hopefully simplifies that uh, traditional methods of single gene knockouts can be quite a laborious process especially given that the genome of a typical salmonella isolate can contain more than 4,800 genes. So what if I told you there was a way or it was possible to disrupt and functionally knock out each and every gene in the genome of an isolate simultaneously? This is the opportunity that Travis presents as this technique is the holy grail of high throughput phenotypic screening assayed by DNA sequencing. So uh, TRADIS enables the functional analysis of every gene in the genome simultaneously, as we can see in the slide here, using a modified transposon mutagenesis. It works on the principle that if a transposon inserts into an essential gene, that gene is disrupted and functionally silenced, and we can no longer recover viable mutants at that loci if the gene is important for a given selective pressure. 
This concept is depicted by the image to the right, if you'll bear with me for this potentially laboured analogy. During World War II, uh, data were collected from the Allied planes that returned to the hangars on where bullet holes were observed, as seen by the red dots on the image. Uh, the Allied generals demanded that these areas were reinforced with metal, which was scarce at the time. However, the statistical research group famously and correctly disagreed that uh, these data were biased towards survivors and that only planes that didn't take critical damage made it back to that hangar. And therefore, it's these regions with no bullet holes or transpose on insertions that were essential and should be reinforced. So this schematic then depicts the generation of the random mutant pool in the Travis technique, whereby I took the wild type isolate, subjected it to multiple technical and biological replicates of electroporation, perforating the genome with transpose on insertions or red dot bullet holes, if we continue the plain analogy. These mutants were then plated out on antibiotic containing agar to select for those bacteria which had been successfully mutated. Lastly, all of the viable colonies from the agar plates were pooled together, giving me a starter pool of over 300,000 unique mutants. And moving on to this next slide, whereas before I was showing you an image of a plane where all of the bullet holes were located, here I have the chromosome and plasmid of the Salmonella Tennessee genome with the y-axis showing the number of transposon insertions in both directions, positive and negative strand of the double-stranded genome. As an internal control, this technique also reconfirms already known essential genes. On the previous slide, I included the full 4.95 million base pair genome, whereas here I have zoomed all the way into a 20,000 base pair region which includes uh, subunit proteins of the 50S ribosome. As many of you will know or may not know, the ribosome is essential for protein production. And we can see along the top of this slide that no viable mutants were recovered for insertions in these genes. With all looking well regarding the input pool and known landmark essential genes, to then determine what genes are essential for survival within macrophages, I carried out uh, multiple scaled up ex vivo infections again, only this time with the mutant pool in human macrophages, and recovered the viable survivors or claims that made it back to the hangar, if you will, at uh, various time points during the course of the infection. Then using a modified sequencing protocol or a recipe, I was able to then determine where these insertions were present in the viable bacteria. Similar to before, this region depicts a 20,000 base pair window where novel genes are predicted to be involved in virulence. In the absence of a selective pressure, the input pool along the middle of the slide tolerates uh, multiple insertions in this region uh, where the gene at the bottom is colored yellow. However, upon passaging these mutants through the human macrophages, as described previously, we can immediately see a strong selection for an effector like virulence protein that was previously uncharacterized in salmonella at two hours post-infection. So expanding this logic across the whole genome from two hours to five days post-infection, I was able to determine the minimal set of 290 genes for survival under no selection in vitro. So this is corroborated by similar and other methods. Then the more novel aspect is the being able to temporarily track the emergence of an additional set of essential genes, ex vivo, which increased over time during macrophage infection. Uh, this list forms a panel of targets for current phenotypic characterization of salmonella virulence and is a focus of my research program. I feel that this method is the future being able to address the challenges that were discussed. And like many of your own areas of research, this is increasingly and by necessity becoming a multidisciplinary area, which is why it's important to engage in both uh, bioinformatic and molecular microbiology expertise and techniques. So uh, that's the last slide I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, hopefully many of you are still with us. Uh, at the risk of sounding like someone with a transpose on shaped hammer, I'd be very interested to talk to other members of the Institute who feel these techniques may be useful to their own research nails or questions as it may be. So please do feel free to reach out, reach out and I'd be more than happy to take any burning questions if there are any. So uh, thank you very much. Uh,